Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We live in a world that's full of malice and hate and violence. So often we're surrounded by physical abuse, emotional abuse, verbal abuse. And of course, it's a world where there's many wars and rumours of wars, terrorism and acts of violence towards one another. And sometimes we can almost despair. Is it ever going to change? Well, of course, it will change when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom. Then we're told the lion will lie down with the lamb. But do we need to wait until then? Well, of course, for those who have received the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God has already come. Jesus comes to live in our hearts and reigns in our hearts. And when that happens, the lion can become the lamb. This is Set Free with Ken Legg. Thanks for joining us. This week we've been looking at the subject of coping with criticism, something we all have to do from time to time. Now, just a quick recap. We started the week out by saying that it's important that we should be careful who we allow to speak into our lives because words can shape our lives. And if we let the wrong words to get a grip on us, then they can possibly even devastate us. We saw how Charles Spurgeon was almost destroyed by the words of his critics and also great leaders like Paul in the Bible and Jesus were constantly criticised. And Ken, as you say, everyone that God has used has had to learn how to cope with criticism, haven't they? That's right. And, and remember that criticism often says more about the critic than it does about the one being criticised. Mm. Let's just give you a couple of examples there. You remember uh, when Hannah came to the temple she was speaking to the Lord, but words weren't coming out. She, her lips were moving. And Eli just automatically assumed that she was drunk. Maybe he was projecting the behavior of his own sons onto this woman. You see, often criticism can come from one's own unresolved issues. What about the time when Judas judged Mary, uh, you know, when she brought that alabaster box of ointment uh, to the feet of Jesus? And he said, why wasn't this sold and the money given to the poor. Mm. The Bible says he doesn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and he would help himself to what was in the bag, you know. And so criticism is not always a good evaluation of what's happening in the victim's life, but often what's happening in the critic's life. Interesting to think of when we cast criticism ourselves, isn't it, of things that might be going on in our own world, our own perspective, often then shapes the criticism we'll have of, uh, of other people. We've learned a lot. Uh, looking at people like Paul, for example, and these stories you've just noted just there, you know, when when these guys were under the pressure of criticism, let's just look at Paul again, in fact, uh, of what he did. Well, first of all, he had little regard for what his critics had to say. He said, with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you. But secondly, it's important to be accountable. And this comes out of mutually accountable relationships in the body of Christ where you know that any criticism that comes your way is going to be constructive criticism. It's come from a heart and a person that really cares about you, wants the best for you. And I always say avoid these kind of hit-and-run critics that just want to dump on you and then shoot out the door, Mm. you know. Uh, That's not of God. And don't read anonymous hate mail that's just going to mess with your mind and leave you under a lot of condemnation for the rest of the day. We need to put a boundary around our lives and guard ourselves from that kind of thing. But thirdly, of course, we do need to learn to self-evaluate. God has given us a conscience, and so our friends are greater than our critics, but our conscience is greater than even our friends. But we've said there's something even greater than our conscience, and that, of course, is God Himself. You remember, uh, Paul said, I don't know anything against myself, but I'm not condemned by this. I'm not even judged by this. He who judges me is the Lord. And I think that means two things. First of all, regarding our position, that that judgment concerning who we are, you know, the value that um, is placed upon our lives, that has already taken place at the cross. We couldn't get a greater value judgment than what Jesus did at the cross. He said, this is how much you are loved. This is how valuable you are. You are of unsurpassable worth. Now, only God knows how precious we are. So don't let others tell us otherwise. Don't let other people bring us under condemnation and low self-esteem by their criticism. Now, concerning our practical walk, you know, the things that we do, our behavior and so on, well, God will guide us. Uh, John says, if our heart 
condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. So if our heart condemns us, there's no point in proceeding further because God is greater than our conscience and he won't give us the green light if our conscience gives us the red light. It really comes down to us understanding what our position is with God. And I mean, you use the phrase self-esteem. Yeah, I'd actually probably go on a limb here and say that it's more about us understanding God's esteem of us. So yeah. how God actually values us. And when we get our head around that and really understand it, then to a certain, certain degree, it doesn't matter what anybody throws at us. Yeah. It won't stick because we get our value from him. Now, recasting back to yesterday as well, we looked at the fact that whilst we can learn to handle criticism, we still have to deal with the critics themselves because uh, sometimes they stick around and they don't necessarily disappear from our lives. You mentioned that God gives us meekness. Let's just recap on on that. Yes, um, meekness enables us to walk away and leave our critic to God. Now, if anyone needs to deal with your critic, God will. But of course, if you do, he won't. Uh, when we strike back of our, at our critic, we're basically just meeting flesh with flesh. And so as to strike back at criticism with words, whether they are words of self-justification or counter-criticism, that's the way of defeat. It's to meet flesh with flesh. Oh, that is so much easier said than done. Because, yeah. you know, we just want to respond back. Yeah. But again, I guess you look at Jesus and you know, when he had his accusers. Yeah. What did he say? Uh, Well, let's look at what he did say. Um, In fact, let's just read what Peter said about Jesus. He said, Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. Mm. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges Righteously. Now, that's the important thing. He didn't just walk away and leave it sort of hanging. He committed the situation to God. Because as I say, if anyone needs to judge our critic, God will. I've always been intrigued by that passage where Paul says, don't avenge yourselves, but give place to wrath. What does that mean? Don't Give place to anger. Give place to wrath. What he goes on to say, because it is written, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. So we give place. We give room for God to move in that situation. That's what I say. If we react to our critic, if we seek our own revenge, then God will not act on our behalf. But Mm. if we give place for God to move, that's exactly what he would do. Remember David, he had his uh, critic. You know, Saul was always constantly hounding him and really wanted to put him to death. And in fact, David had the opportunity on two occasions to take Saul's life. You remember he was surrounded um, uh, he surrounded Saul when Saul was sleeping in the cave and one of his men said, let me go in and take him out. And David said, no, don't touch the Lord's anointed. But he said this, he said, his day will come. If anyone needs to take judgment or revenge upon Saul, it's God's will to do that. He'll do that in his time and in his way if he thinks it's necessary, mm. but it's his department. And so he said, his day will come. And we need to remember that as children of the king, We walk with honor and bearing through this life. People will criticize us, but don't let us become like them by retaliating and behaving the same way. Let's remember that we are children of the king, and let's walk, as I say, with bearing and with honor. I believe this, Phil, about criticism, that it's basically designed to distract us from what God has called us to do. It's like um, a decoy. Uh, that's basically getting us off track so that we get focused on this criticism and we stop doing what we have been called to do. It's a classic ploy in any argument, isn't it? You you just throw in some curly thing off to the side and you lose your track. And that's that's what we need to be careful of when people are throwing criticism in our way and to respond with meekness, uh, which really is not responding at all in, in often. And we do need to focus. So the thing is to to keep focused on what God has called us to do and not become distracted by the criticisms and the judgments of others. Well, that brings us to the end of our series this week. Hope you can join us next week when we start a brand new one. Until then, remember, you don't have to carry that baggage. God wants you to be set free. For books, DVDs, small group studies and other resources from Ken Legg, including the book What's Eating You, which features topics from today's message, shop online at vision.org.au.
That's vision.org.au.